uh, they could come to our community center and they could meet with an attorney and get legal advice and get legal representation. Amen. Now, uh, th three of these programs were made uh, into uh, federal programs by the government. In 1974, the federal government allocated money for a nationwide free breakfast program. That's why kids can go to school today and get breakfast and lunch at a reduced rate because of the Black Panther Party. Right. In 1974, the federal government also recognized that what we were doing was correct and they allocated money for community medical clinics. And that's today, that's why we have community medical clinics today, is because of the Black Panther Party, because All we right. set the example. Also, they made the uh, free legal aid program into a national program. About eight years ago, I needed to see an attorney. I didn't have any money. I went to the office, city of Seattle Community Service Office, because I heard they had a legal aid program there, and so I went and met with this attorney, and uh, I'm sitting there looking at him, and I'm saying to him, I, I asked him, I said, man, do you know why this program exists? And he didn't know. I said, this program exists because of the Black Panther Party. So we would go on to do do many things. In, in, in Chicago, in um, Oakland, in 1972, we ran Bobby Sill for mayor and Elaine Brown for city council because we recognized that being involved in the political process was very important. But first of all, Shirley Chisholm, the first black congresswoman, she announced her uh, run for presidency. And a lot of the black politicians turned their back on her because they said, how dare a black woman want to run for president? But it was the Black Panther Party that came to her aid and came to her support and supported her campaign All because right. we recognize the importance of that. So we also recognize the importance of running our own political candidates. In 1972, we ran Bobby Sill for mayor and the name Brown for city council. And to kick off that campaign, we uh, gave away 10,000 bags of groceries with the chicken in every bag, Looking if you can imagine. You know, I remember the 10,000 bags, empty bags laid out on the uh, floor of the Oakland Auditorium. And we had to put eggs in there, bag of potatoes, uh, canned food, a loaf of bread, and the last thing to go in the bag was a bag of chichi. So we kicked that campaign off by giving out 10,000 bags of groceries. And we also uh, uh, tested uh, 2,000 people for sickle cell anemia. Now, sickle cell anemia was a disease that a lot of people did not know about. A lot of black people did not know about. It's a disease that primarily affects black people. And so through our newspaper, uh, we did an expose on sickle cell anemia to make sure people knew what sickle cell anemia was and how it affected you and how it affected your body and what type of treatment that you needed. And then what we did after that was we began to go test people. Because we had a newspaper that came out every single week we understood how important the newspaper was because we used to say that power is the ability to define phenomena and make it act in a desired manner. That meant you had to be able to, if you want to have power, you got to be able to define it. And through our newspaper, we were able to define what was going on in our community. Not somebody else, not the mass media, right. but we were able to define it. And through us being able to define it, we were able to come up with solutions for our problems in the community. That's why the Black Panther paper was so important. And we had a lot of great writers, a lot of good photographers, a lot of college students had, that had joined the Black Panther Party, and, the, and that newspaper became one of the finest alternative newspapers in the world. And we used to have a circulation of 130,000 mm. per week going all over the world, the Black Panther newspaper. Right. So in the party, we were working all the time, we were working eight, or we were working, you know, 20 hours a day sometimes. And as, as, as our programs began to develop, we came under intense assault by the FBI. They began to raid our offices. They began to kill leaders of the Black Panther Party. They began to imprison a lot of people. They even sent the police into the breakfast programs in LA and Chicago and New York to try to scare the kids away from the breakfast program because they didn't want the kids to see that the Black Panther Party was doing what they were supposed to be doing. And on uh, December 3rd, Fred Hampton 
uh, was meeting with his staff. And we met a lot. We had to meet and plan because we were doing all these things. We were doing a lot of work. And, uh, you know, if, if you were in the Black Panther Party at that time, you got up at 6 in the morning, went to the breakfast program. Uh, you, you served the kids breakfast. You came home, uh, came back to the community center. You had to go out in the, paper, in the field and sell 100 papers a day because we really understood how important it was to get the paper out for the people to read it. And uh, then you came in, if you were working in the breakfast program or one of the other programs, the liberation school, then you had to work on that. So the liberation school, they didn't have any um, uh, programs, uh, summer programs for working mothers. They couldn't drop, there was nowhere for them to drop their kids off. So we started what was called the liberation school. During the summer, parents, low-income parents, they could drop their kids off at the liberation school. We would provide lunch for them and breakfast for them. And we would take them on field trips. So uh, we were working all the time. So Fred Hampton was meeting with his staff on the night of December 3rd, and he didn't know that the, his security person was the FBI informant, and he had given the layout to Fred Hampton's home to the FBI. And he had also put some second oil in Fred Hampton's drink and, and drugged Fred Hampton. So on the morning of December 4th, there's a knock on the door of Fred Hampton's apartment. 19-year-old Mark Clark goes to the door because he's on security. He says, who is it? The shots rang out. They go through the door and kill Fred Hampton instant, uh, kill Mark Clark instantly. Simultaneously, the FBI burst through the rear door. Um, they go into Fred Hampton's room. Fred Hampton's wife was eight months pregnant. She tried to wake Fred, but he wouldn't wake up. So she lays on top of him to protect him. And the police come in and there, they drag her off, take her out of the room. They go back into the room and shoot Fred Hampton in the head three times wow. and kill him. 21 years old. That's how much they were afraid of Fred Hampton. Anybody who met Fred Hampton, I met him. I met him in uh, December of uh, 1968. And when I met him and I heard him speak, I said, oh my God, who is this young man? And anybody who met him, he could inspire anybody. He could inspire young people. He inspired anybody who listened to him. He inspired a group of white lawyers who opened up a program called the PLO, the People's Law Office, which is still open today. <coughs> still open today. So, uh, Fred Hampton was a tremendous loss. It was one of the saddest days that I ever had until this very day. It's still one of the saddest days because I think about what if Fred Hampton lived? What if Martin Luther King had lived? What if Malcolm X had lived? What about if Medgar Evers had lived? Would we be in the position that we are in now? I don't think so. So, um, over a course of two or three years, there would be 30 members of the Black Panther Party that would be killed. Um, and um, there would be 800 members of the Black Panther Party that would be in prison to this very day. We have 20 political prisoners of the Black Panther Party who have been in prison for 45 years, many of them in solitary confinement. And we still want them to be free. So I know I don't have much time uh, oh, left, keep but... Going. You keep going. <laughs> keep going. We need to hear this. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, um... Yeah, in, uh, in 1972, when I went down to Oakland, Oakland was flooded with cocaine. Cocaine was a casual drug at that time. And um, um, uh, Huey had just gotten out of prison. And uh, somebody introduced Huey to the starting cocaine. Now, Huey was a very complicated person. He was, his, he was a father. He was a... Um, uh, the youngest child of seven. His father was a preacher. And he had two older brothers, one older brother who was a gangster and a thug who taught Huey how to fight. He had another brother who would go on to become a college professor and taught Huey how to read, how to read philosophy and how to understand great things. And so Huey had this rare combination of, of, of brilliance. He had a brilliant mind. He really had a brilliant mind. He was probably one of the most brilliant minds that we've ever had in the last 50 years. 
and he had this also other side to him where he was fearless. Nothing. He was not afraid of anybody. He was not afraid of confronting the police. And when the party first started in Oakland, and he recognized that they had a right to bear arms, he organized the 20 or 30 Panthers at that time to go out on the streets and start patrolling the police. They had armed patrols. Because a lot of these police in Oakland and LA and San Francisco recruited, were recruited from the Deep South. And they were bringing a lot of those racist practices with them to Oakland and San Francisco and LA. So he we said, okay, let's get some cameras, let's get some law books, and we have a right, it says that we have a right to observe the police to do their job. And so he taught the comrades how to properly hold their weapons and how to conduct themselves with their weapons, and they began to go out on the streets and patrol the police. And every time they would get behind the police car when they would stop a black person, they would get out of the police car, they would stand 15 feet away, they would inform the police that they had a right to observe what was taking place. They would also inform the, the black person that they had stopped that they only had to give the name, the address, and the social security number. And there were many times when the police was shocked. I mean, if you could imagine a, a policeman from Louisiana or Alabama seeing 15 armed black men with rifles and shotguns standing at attention, he was shocked, and there were many stories where Huey, where the police would say to Huey, nigger, what are you doing with that gun? And Huey would jack around off in his shotgun and say, pig, what are you doing with your gun? I have a right to have my weapon. If you try to take my weapon, if you try to shoot me, I'm going to defend myself. That's the type of person that Huey was. And so after many incidents like this, they decided that they had to kill Huey Newton. So one night, Huey was traveling with a friend. Uh, they had just been out socializing, he had been to a party, and they took, uh, they stopped the car, they took Huey out of the car, and took him into the back of the police car. Shots were fired. Huey had two bullets in his stomach, and one of the policemen was dead, and another one was wounded. Huey had a law book that he used to carry around with him. And he had cut out the inside of the law book and had a 38 in there. So when they took him back and they tried to kill him, he pulled his weapon out, out of the law book, and defended himself. And he was charged with attempted murder and murdering a police officer, and he went on trial. And that's, uh, that, that is what, who Huey was. He was a tremendous Huey human being. Now, when he got out of prison, the Black Panther Party uh, was a international organization. We had support organizations all over the world, in Japan and Sweden and London and France and everywhere. We also had in, uh, diplomatic status in Algeria, the Algerian government. We had, there were a lot of Panthers that had gone to exile, uh, so they all ended up in, in Algeria, so the Black Panther Party actually had diplomatic status in Algeria. They were given a diplomatic compound uh, in which to operate from. So uh, when Huey comes out of prison, he's a superhero uh, all over the world. People know who Huey P. Newton is. The organization is, 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 is big. There are people that uh, he did not know because he was a very, uh, he wasn't a person that liked to be around a lot of people. And so he became very paranoid. And then once he was introduced to cocaine, he started snorting cocaine. And, um, and you know, Huey, as I said, was very complicated. He began to realize that he did not want to be this superhero. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, that we're all bought into this earth to do good things. We all have a role that we have to do. And sometimes the expectations for us are much higher than what we are really able to give. You know, a lot of us can't live up to our expectations. I surely have not been able up to live up to the expectations that people had for me. And this was the case with Huey P. Newton, that he did not want to be this figure anymore. He just wanted to be Huey in Oakland, and that's it. So he began to dismantle the Black Panther Party. And so by 1980, the Black Panther Party went out of existence. And, but the legacy of the party will live on forever. The legacy of the party lives all over the world. I have a 
had a chance to travel all over the world. Other Panthers have had to travel all over the world. And it, it is unbelievable how much people know throughout the world about the Black Panther Party and how much they recognize and understand and still hold on to the legacy of the Black Panther Party, which says that everybody has a right to be free. Everybody has a right to fight for their freedom. And, and uh, the, the, the Black Panther Party, uh, what we did uh, has been copied all over the world by organizations and liberation organizations all over the world. And today, here we are today, you know, things are worse today than they were then. You know, during the era when I was growing up, we had a communal spirit, you know. You could always go to Mrs. Jones' house next door and get some sugar or down the street and borrow an egg. You know, I remember the Chinese store on the corner. You know, anytime anybody needed any food and they didn't have any money, they could go to Joe's and they could get food, everything they needed on credit. You know, they didn't need no credit card or sign no papers. You just take what you need because he knew you were going to bring it back. Amen. And so we don't have that communal spirit anymore. We have an individual spirit. They, right. they really push yeah. that individualism on us. Amen. They want us to be individual because they know as long as we are trying to do things individually and trying to compete against one another and trying to fight against one another, be the best and be number one and be a superstar, they know that they have more control over us that way. So we have to come together. That's why it's, it's, it feels so good to be in a place like this because I feel that communal spirit in here because the church has always played an important role in the black community, but the church has gotten away from that role. Yes. Amen. It's gotten Amen. away from that role. Right. And we need the church to get back to that right. original role yes, of serving yeah. the people and bringing the people together Amen. and supporting the people. So, um, you know, I'm... I'm I'm hoping that, you know, we can start coming together because if we don't, you know, the environment is under tremendous assault, tremendous assault by the corporations that control this country and are trying to control the world. Amen. And, you know, they're fracking and there's, every day we hear about an oil spill, we hear about a coal spill, coal ash spill, you know, we hear about rivers and lakes that are so polluted they'll never come back to life again. And they're trying to cut all the welfare programs off. They want us to, only thing they want from us is to shop, is to Say consume. That. That's all they want, is to consume. And because that's all they care about is money. That's, right. that's all, they don't care about us. Michael Jackson wrote a song. He's got a video, you should watch that video. They don't care about us. That's the name of the song. They don't care about us, and that is true. They don't care about Amen. us. Say that. They don't care about us, you know? So uh, we have to realize this. We got to wake up because we're like the walking dead. We're like uh -huh. zombies. That's right. Uh, allowing this to happen to ourselves, allowing this to happen to our environment. And we have to come together. We got to wake up. Amen. We got to uh, protect our families, protect our communities, and understand that uh, we have to build broad coalitions with other people. I mean, we, we should never forget what happened to the Native Americans. You know, we should always pay homage to the indigenous people of this land yeah. because 50 million Native Americans died and they had their lands taken away from them. And now their lands are under assault because they have resources on their lands. We should never forget the 20, 000, 20 million slaves that died in slavery. You know, we we got to bring history back. Now, the Jewish community, they never let you forget about the Holocaust. They, sure don't. they have Holocaust museums all over the country, all over the world. Every year, there's two or three movies about the Holocaust that are coming out. And we don't have that. Because they understand how important it is to connect their kids to that history that gives them a sense of unity and a sense of purpose. We tried to sweep that under the rug, the whole slavery thing, and just forget about it. It didn't happen, don't worry about it. No, no, we gotta bring that back to life. That's right. We need to create our own Holocaust museum. All right. You know, because it was a Holocaust, a great Holocaust that happened to us. Why should we forget it? Yes. So, these are things that we gotta do. These are things we gotta do, and I'm very thankful for being here today. 
And uh, thank you for listening to me. And as we used to say, all power to the people. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Amen.